Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm on a strict time count, so I'm just going to put this on so I know how long I've got left. Um, it's, it's lovely. I've been doing, this is the, my fifth talk, and it, it's great to see so many familiar faces, uh, friends, and of course colleagues as a community of practice. There aren't many of us in the country compared with other manual therapies, but when we do get together, there's, there's often a real buzz, and it's great to meet, meet and mix and talk to folks. So thank you very much for coming. Progressively, I'm not quite sure what it says about my presentation, but progressively it's getting presented as intensive or with lots of information <laughs> and framed like it's really hard to get hold of. So I hope I'll make it accessible and I'm happy to take questions um, later on. Um, so briefly I want to talk about the structure of this talk, a bit about the background and some of the concerns that have been touched on already. Um, again, briefly about this business of what adverse events are, um, some of the definitions in that area, which I think Pippa will take up a bit later on. Um, then talk about um, the methods, a little bit of context about the methods, because it's important that folks know how the information is derived, and then go on to the results, which is the main part of this, and then some observations and reflections for practice. You've heard already about the standards, and the key thing is really, in a way, the content of the standards is much the same. So um, it's about giving folks the information they need, which is something that we're all familiar with, um, and particularly around letting patients know what they, when they can say to stop treatment, to ask questions, and this business of explaining risk effectively to patients, um, and what that means for individual patients, um, which has caused some concern. And then the issue of valid consent, what that might mean, explain to folks the whole process of treatment, the interventions and the examination, um, and receiving some sort of acknowledgement of that. And, and I, use the, I try and use the word receiving consent because obtaining consent sounds a little bit like something you might do with thumb screws. Um, now, some of the external pressures, and, and this is really ongoing and a challenge for us at the moment as a profession, and not just related to this business of risk, but towards evidence and the claims we make. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the writings of um, Professor Ernst, um, who is a very prolific author. Um, and he's raised concerns, and others have raised concerns, particularly about cervical manipulation and stroke. And I'll touch on that a bit, but, 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 and we can talk about that later in the break um, if we need to. I won't focus on that. But also issues for children and adverse events, and also the raising questions about consent. You know, if we're mostly in the private sector and we're, we're unclear about the documented benefits of our treatment, and we're supposed to be recommending alternative potential treatments, is there a conflict of interest there? And how do we do this? Um, most of Professor Ernst's um, activities to date have focused on chiropractors. Um, but I suspect that our profession is also going to receive more attention in the future and, and is, is currently, there are a few more publications about that. There's a recent systematic review which kind of concluded there's no evidence of the effectiveness of osteopathy to date, which of course has been challenged, but you know, that's the direction some of these authors are going in. That I think we need to think about and address as a community of osteopaths, but also in the needs for, in terms of our patients. What we're here is to deliver good care to patients, and, and we need to provide the right evidence to help patients. Now, some of this, I don't know if you can see this, some of the language of this is getting really quite strong. It's very rare that you'd find the word victim in an academic publication. Um, but this also spreads out to the big wide world. You know, beware the spinal trap. This isn't from The Guardian. Some practitioners claim it's a cure-all, but research suggests chiropractic therapy can be lethal. Does upper cervical spine manipulation cause vascular accidents? And this, I, I was familiar with this, I, I was involved in in developing the NICE guidelines for persistent low back pain. And after that, there was this mixture in the press. This is from Pulse, which goes to every GP practice in the country. Um, certainly in the GP practice that I work in, I don't know any of the GPs that read it, but it certainly goes to every practice in the country. Um, and some of the information from the NICE guidelines kind of got all confused. Now, that was all about back pain. And some of the headlines were about people getting strokes for cervical manipulation. 
So there's, there's an awareness there. How much difference that makes is uncertain. What sort of impact it makes is uncertain. But certainly there's an undercurrent of concern around this that I think you know, we need to address. So reasonably speaking, I think, osteopaths are concerned. And that's really about their confidence to deliver risk-related information. So you know, questions about, well, what is the risk? All this stuff about chiropractors. We know, and, and if you, I don't know if anyone in here has had to do it, stand on a platform, you stand more in years gone by, where you had to say what osteopathy is and what chiropractic is and what physiotherapy is, and if you've got three speakers from the three disciplines, you're desperate to get on first, uh, <coughs> in case there wasn't much left if you're on third, number one. <laughs> but what often happened was practitioners would say, well, we're the ones who do the safe manipulation. Yeah? They do it dangerously, we do it safely. So this whole issue about the interventions we make and how safe it is, is important. And for us, we're talking about codes of practice, but essentially this is, the issue for us is adhering to the law, because well, this is frames about codes and regulations are regulated, but this is the law and this is what we have to adhere to. So in response to some of these, codes, some of these um, issues, I think quite innovatively, to, to bat for the GOC um, for a moment, I think innovatively, because regulators at the time weren't really commissioning much research, and certainly not prime research, but the GOC said, well, let's address some of these issues. So what they did was they commissioned some work um, which Dawn Carnes, who, who's in the room somewhere, led on, which is a systematic review of risks associated with manual therapy, um, which has been published and is available on the Ozone, the full report is available on the Ozone. Also some work led by Jan Leach, um, which was about communicating risk, which Pippa's presentation draws on heavily. Again, that's available on the Ozone. And then another study which was um, looking at trends and synthesising complaints to the regulator and what happened with those, but also insurance claims. And all those reports are definitely worth, worth a read. Um, and they're available on the Ozone. I think they're out in the exhibitor's um, room today to have a flick through. But do, do access those. And whilst you're on the Ozone, a quick plug for IJOM and the um, um, resources available there. You've got manual therapy. You've got um, several journals of interest. You just have to plug away at it and, and get access and get used to them. And you can set yourself up alerts. So contents pages from manual therapy and JMPT, for example, can land in your inbox as soon as they're published. And you can access all text of those. Now, the study that, 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 that we were awarded at the British School of Osteopathy with colleagues was more collecting primary data, and it was aimed at looking at how practitioners, I'm not presenting this data today, but how practitioners assess risk, um, kind of measures they take in terms of consent and behaviour, and also characterising osteopathic practice. And I'm sad I can't share much of that to you today, but if, if folks are interested in this work, I'm happy to talk to regional groups. Um, we also looked at patients' experience, um, and we looked at the experience of practitioners and patients in more detail by doing interviews. So I'll come back to the methods a little bit in a moment. The context of this is this kind of language. I mean, these are all words around treatment reactions, adverse events. So certainly in the late 80s, early 90s, healing crisis was a popular word. So I'm sure some folks will be familiar with which meant something like, it's all right to get worse before you get better. And that's common to some other um, complementary therapies. But also complications, treatment reactions, side effects. And these are all language in this area. And definitions are, are quite rare. What we've used for some of this work is stuff that's been published, particularly in chiropractic. And there are only two studies that have done this well. Um, and there, I think I've got put a list of references for folks who want to follow it up, it is in your pack. That's the Rubenstein study and the Teal study, which looked at manipulation of the neck in particular, very large studies relating to the neck. So <clears throat> what, what, what did we go with? This is, uh, we use an adaptation of the WHO definition, which points out that it's an untoward medical occurrence and not necessarily related to cause. So it doesn't mean that the intervention has caused it, but it's happened in the context of the care that's been given. Yeah. And that applies to the, the work we've done here that become evident as I talk about the results. Now, with a pharmaceutical intervention, it's a bit easier in a way. It's a simple intervention. You've got one thing going in, context of care, and it's done. 
kind of stuff we do is, is much more like acupuncture, much more like psychotherapy. It's a complex intervention. We're using multiple interventions. We're talking, we're giving advice, we're giving exercise prescriptions. Our interventions themselves vary. So it's really quite hard for us to define treatments, clearly. You know, is that how hard you push when you're doing, say, springing? Is it how many times you push? Is it how many times, dosage-wise, you see someone in a week? And we use a very individualised model of care, um, I think. I've yet to look at that data to see how individualised our care is, but I, I will do in due course. Um, and defining dosages and assessing patient responses is really quite challenging for osteopathy and other manual therapies. And thinking about the kind of conditions we commonly see, lots of those musculoskeletal ones, actually they don't follow a nice time course. They're variable. You know, people get flare-ups of pain which seem unclear and, and not easy to attribute cause to. Onset of pain, people wake up with pain or they do a movement they've done a hundred times before and suddenly they've got increased pain. It's a very complex phenomena with lots of uncertainty. And establishing cause, certainly for the rare events that are of interest to osteopaths going back to the stroke, to really establish cause to do future getting people and following people over time you kind of need to use all the stroke units in the country to get enough um, to really sort this out for manual therapy. And that's just not going to happen. So how we approached it was we did a, um, <coughs> a practitioner survey and I want to thank everyone in the audience who took part in that. It was quite a long instrument and without this sort of participation and with some of the standardised data collection we can't move forward, we can't get um, data to explain what we're doing more effectively. So thank you very much to everyone who did that and particularly those folks who said at the end they might be willing to give questionnaires out to their patients. So we started off here with a practitioner survey and then some folks said they'd give questionnaires out to patients and that was over here. And the patient survey looked at the experience of treatment and outcomes. We asked people before they had treatment, one day after treatment, and two days after treatment. And patients who said, OK, you can contact me again later, we followed them up six weeks later by post. So we got four measures with the patients. And then, based on a range of criteria, we selected folks particularly for interview. So we selected practitioners who had experienced serious adverse events and those who hadn't. And we, we selected patients who'd reported increase in symptoms and who'd reported some disability that they thought was related to osteopathy. And we interviewed those people to try and find, to get a bit more rich, rich information uh, about people's experience, both as a practitioner but as a patient. And a little bit of that data I'm going to present today. So serious adverse events comes from the pa uh, practitioner data. The... Um, <clears throat> the intensity of symptoms and pain and how people are doing comes from the patient survey data, their experience of care, and there's a little bit about the serious adverse events from the interview studies. So, you'll be wanting to know how many folks we um, involved. We surveyed initially the population of osteopaths and we got approaching 30% of the population. Now, 30% as a response rate to professionals is not bad. In GPs, um, you normally get about between 15 and 18% response rates. But bearing in mind, this is the population. So 30, nearly 30% of osteopaths gave us data. For the patient survey, it's a little bit more complicated because we went via practitioners. Um, but I think the key is underlined. Um, the data there is underlined, the information. 2,057 folks gave us baseline data, so before treatment and at day one and day two. <clears throat> of those, 1,700 said we could follow them up six weeks later. And at six weeks, we got about a 77% response rate. And there were 30, nearly 1,400 patients in that. So baseline, day one, day two, up to six weeks. Lots of data. Before doing this, I wasn't grey. If only that was true. Um, we interviewed 23 practitioners and 19 patients in accordance to, as I described earlier, picked for their special qualities. So, um, I want to tell you a bit about some of the main outcomes. Now, when, when you measure patient intensity, we, we of course recognised when we did, when we were on, I think, probably on draft 29 of the original questionnaire, um, we recognised that Asking patients, osteopathic patients, just about pain wasn't appropriate because some people's come in, come in with symptoms. So we framed it as symptoms, stroke, pain. And we had a scale here, which was from zero, none. 
And it was a surprise to me how many folks come in with none. I'll show you some data about that earlier. Lots of people seem, well, a fair proportion come in with no symptoms, and then worse symptoms and pain. And we measured this uh, in terms of current. We said, right now, your main complaint, where are you on this scale? We asked people about averages. Um, we also asked about global intensity and a range of other measures I'm not describing today. <clears throat> now, what we use in terms of measuring this, w this is a, a scale from 0 to 10. Now, in mainstream kind of outcomes and trials, people are very keen on saying, what's the minimal important change that means something to patients, right? So if you're on a three and you go from a three to two, is that actually important? Does that make a difference? If you're on a ten and you go to nine, is that worth having? Yeah? So there's this notion of the minimally important clinical change to patients. Now how folks are doing it at the moment is they're taking a 30% line. So they're saying, right, 30% of an eight reduction is worth having. 30% of a 2 reduction is worth having. Now, our colleagues in chiropractor did the same thing for increases in intensity for adverse events. And that's what we did. And it kind of worked, kind of didn't. I'll give you some data for that in a moment. Because we were nervous about doing that, because 30% of 1, it's very easy to get included to get an increase, is very different from 30% of 6. And so you struggle either end of the scale. You get... Um, effects where you hit the top and you get doesn't get reported and you get floor effects down in the bottom so what we did is we did it in absolute values as well taking a change over two points um, and we've done it um, in a subsidiary analysis I'm not presenting today we've done no change um, and then worse and better but that'll hopefully come out later we're aiming at the BMJ but my hunch is it won't get in but we'll see so on to the results so this is for an increase using that 30% threshold. What we see is that 18% of patients at day one have a 30% increase using that threshold. And at day two, this falls to 12, and at uh, week six to 14. What are the things associated with this at week six? Well, low intensity of pain symptoms. So those folks with score lowly when they come in at uh, 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 day one before treatment, they have a bigger chance of having an increase in symptoms at week six. And if you look at that, you can see those figures there. About 80% of folks who have this increase in threshold at six weeks are accounted for by having a low pain score at the beginning. So those predictors at six weeks, low levels of pain, and the other thing that comes out is multi-site pain. Now, this room is full of experienced clinicians. I don't think that'll be a surprise. The, more, the higher number of sites of pain people present with with troublesome pain, the more likely they are to report an increase in pain. Yeah? Those are more complex patients, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. Interestingly, and we're exploring this a little bit further at the moment, things that aren't predictors, type of technique used, or the site of pain. So it doesn't matter if it was neck, back, neck and shoulder, that kind of area, back, low back, pelvis, that wasn't predictive of people having this increase in symptoms. Okay. I'll add to this that the type of osteopathic technique was also not a predictor for positive outcomes either, which is interesting in its own right. So using a two-point, the figures change a little bit. They go down. Um, they become 12% at day one, are having this increase in pain, 6% at day two and at week six, 9.3%. If we're looking at decrease in pain, so this might be assumed to be related to... Um, uh, people having less pain, what you find proportionally is we have 40% of patients are having a significant, a clinically meaningful 30% decrease on this scale. At day two, 55%. At six weeks, 56%. Now, I'm not presenting this today here, but if you um, divide this up into new patients and follow-up patients, you get different answers and the levels respond because we've been surveying here ongoing new patients and returning patients with a new episode. But returning patients and new patients do better generally at six weeks. But these data is fine. The effect sizes are fine in terms of uh, outcomes. This is, this is fine. In terms of people who do better, 
Um, again, more pain sites, less chance of improvement. Higher baseline pain and troublesomeness predicts improvement. People who have got more pain do better. Um, and new episodes and uh, new patients improve most. So here's, um, I'm assured by the, the folks who've been doing this around the country that the more times they see this graph, the more accessible and exciting it gets. <laughs> I shall try and talk you through it. Um, this shows all the data at, at week six. Right. So what you've got there is along one side, you've got the pain score at six weeks from zero to ten. This is pain symptoms. Along the bottom, you've got the score at baseline. And here you've got no change. So what you can see um, is if we take people who came in with a four at baseline, it's that column there. Now some of those people at six weeks had no pain. Some had score of one, some had nine. And what you see overall is the density, dark ones and big blobs are more people. And you can see overall folks are improving. But also informative for practice, we know this day to day, some people get sore and get worse and don't improve very well. So you see some poor devils in this level came in with zero. <laughs> Equally, some folks over here came in with 10 and left with zero. But I, why I, folks tried to kind of persuade me this was too complicated for an audience, but I just wanted to show this because it really gives a picture of the whole kind of range of responses. And you'll recognize that thinking through your patients. You, you recognize that range. But this is on a, on a you know, obviously on a, on a big level. This is based on um, nearly, yeah, 13, 13, more than 1,300 patients. And this profiles out outcomes for osteopathy. <coughs> which I hope you'll find is exciting data because it doesn't really exist for the UK um, before. So in summary, kind of take-home messages, really. The day after treatment, between 10 and 20% of patients um, experience an increase in intensity of their pain and symptoms. Now, that's going to be important. You know, if you were having to, um, as a patient, you are going to attend a funeral the next day and you are going in for treatment, it would be helpful to be informed about that likelihood it might change your decision to take treatment. Yeah? Same if you're going to a wedding, whatever you've got planned, if you've got a long meeting. Yeah? So, so that's a take-home message that I hope folks can use um, uh, on Monday, broadly in clinic, between 10 and 20% of folks, thinking about that, tailoring it to individual patients, have this increase in pain. And I'm sure you, you, you know this to be true from your own practice anyway. And certainly in the interviews, people described thinking between 40 and 50% of people um, had that. Now, other areas of the body, <clears throat> we measured um, troublesomeness symptoms, um, a bit of a mouthful, uh, adapted from the equal mouthful of bothersomeness in the America, um, uh, a scale we use, which seems to be a composite of kind of pain and disability, although we use it and validate it, I'm not entirely sure what it means. Uh, um, we found there weren't any particular areas were vulnerable, so, th you know, this is looking at the hypothesis that when osteopaths treat patients, they're treating their low back, say, people, they get more pain in the neck or get more pain in their leg, more symptoms, troublesome symptoms in the leg. And we generally, these areas were low. Troublesome and decreased overall in the patients over six weeks, uh, and no particular area was vulnerable. For non-muscular skeletal symptoms, and this is a whole list of stuff from dizziness, vertigo, fatigue, uh, fatigue, nausea, uh, bruising, skin rashes, also some um, neuropathically sounding symptoms, pins and needles in arm and leg. Um, the range was fairly low, um, between 2.1% of patients for vomiting uh, and 14% for headaches. headaches. Headaches and fatigue were highest. Uh, decreases was, were generally larger again um, in all cases um, and normally by a factor of two. And day one post-treatment, <clears throat> the range of increase in symptoms, I mean, day one is the closest because it's closest to the actual intervention in terms of the strength of the data, um, was 0.6 for vomiting and 7.8 for fatigue. Interestingly, when you talk to folks about fatigue, they're describing needing time to heal, um, understanding it and framing it positively, um, which is unlike treating it as an adverse event, which is described in the literature. And I know Pippa's going to reflect on the language we use for this and how we describe this and whether adverse event is the right language for this in her talk in a moment. So, in summary, 
the characteristics and resolution, people getting better from this, these, these kind of minor events, um, is in keeping with the manual therapy literature. If anything, our data suggests a lower prevalence. It's a bit lower than in other practices. Um, and I suppose that summary point again is between 10 and 20% have an increase in pain and symptoms, and it's multiple sites and low baseline pain that are things to think about in terms of informing you with your patients on a daily basis. No, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good, good question. We, we, we got records of how many treatments they had. But this is a mixed cohort. You saying on your, you, you, if you're collecting data, you'd say, would you fill this in for me? Patients would fill it in, then go away. And that was all your patients over a period of time, over a week, until you ran out of questionnaires. So it's a mixed bag. And then after that, we asked them what happened straight after treatment, the day after treatment, one day after that. Um, and then those folks said we could contact them, then we wrote to them five and a half weeks later, then they returned it. So what happened in between, we asked them how many treatments we had, um, and some folks said, replied and said things like, I don't think this is very fair because I got hit by a car last week. <laughs> well, I had an operation, or the osteopath was very good, but actually I broke my leg. You know, we had some of those that we had to exclude. But in between, apart from the record of treatments, we don't know how many, what, what's happened to them. They might have had other interventions. We, are, we ask lots of things about what other things have happened, but it's not based on just one treatment. But that's why I say the day one, day two, day three data, uh, day two data is kind of stronger because it's right after the index event, the thing that's the intervention. So getting on to this stuff, um, major moderus. Well, we asked in the questionnaire, and not everyone quite got this in the, in the pilot phase, so we strengthened it a little bit. And we also asked some physio colleagues independent to the study team to code some of this free text data. What we said was, we said to people, over your career, have you had a serious adverse event? And what we mean by a serious one is a treatment reaction leading to hospital referral and or permanent incapacity disability or death. Yeah? That's a serious one. And have you had one of these over your career? And we figured people might remember and they'd put that in. And then we figured stronger data was if they had it over the last year and they'd remember. Yeah? And we asked the prevalence. So this is a, a measure of the period, the time, prevalence, how many. And we asked folks to describe it. What happened? What were the outcomes in free text, which we coded? And we also asked questions of the patients. We asked them things like, have you had, have you had temporary incapacity or disability that you attribute to your osteopathic treatment? Yes, no. We also asked folks if they'd had referral to other practitioners that they attributed related to their osteopathic treatment. So, what are the rates for these kind of major adverse events? And I'll talk about the limits of this data a bit at the end. So, major adverse events, 4.1% of patients have this temporary incapacity or disability. Yeah, they reported that, 4%, which is kind of a, a low rate of self-report, I think. We interviewed lots of these patients. There are a couple of more serious things in them. One was a misdiagnosed or an undiagnosed sciatica. Um, it seemed like a, a radiculopathy that, that I interviewed the lady and she told me about. Um, and it had been missed by the osteopath and made worse, she felt. And, and that was one of them. And she ended up with a hospital referral. And the other was someone with an uh, um, osteoarthritic thumb. I think it sounded by the description kind of like the osteopath said, oh, I can sort that out. And kind of, kind of grabbed it and tugged it. And, did things to it and made it worse. That second patient, permanently worse, that second patient went on to use osteopaths again in the future and kind of construed of it as a kind of little aberration in their osteopathic treatment. <coughs> in terms of career profiles, 12% um, of osteopaths said they'd had such an episode. Uh, that's 131 osteopaths over their career. Now, the, the kind of probably the stronger data is the annual incidence. Of the people who said they'd had something in the last year, 4% of osteopaths said yes, they had. All of those were single entities, so there wasn't any particular osteopath who said, oh, yes, I've got 10, I'm working towards my 15th, you know. <laughs> um, and I want to tell you a little bit about those. Now, in your packs, you've got a kind of clearer summary. Because I'm talking about it, the summary is a bit dull and wordy and thick. So I've put some examples in these things, which I'll go through now. But how we categorised it, we're in these groups of categories. Now, of course, up here in your central neurology, you've got your strokes, etc. Anyway, I'll talk through these. And the summaries are in your, your packs. 
So central neurological symptoms, kind of what, what did we code into there? What did we put in there? Um, and one of the points here that I want to make is, certainly when I've been going around and talking to osteopaths, people in the past have said, look, this just doesn't happen. I would know if this happened. No one's ever told me. This is them, the other manual therapist has happened to. It doesn't happen in osteopathy. But I can certainly say we have very clear evidence it does occur. It occurs infrequently, but it definitely does occur. The kind of stuff we've got in here is vasovagal symptoms, vertigo, hemifacial paresthesias, and some stroke-like interven- stroke symptoms. We had seven people in the sample who described stroke-like um, episodes that their patients had experienced. As an example, the, the bottom one of those two examples, HVT, cervical spine. Uh, I've changed this a bit to protect the identity. Uh, I've made it more general of the individuals. Um, HVT, cervical spine, on an existing middle-aged male, immediate stroke-like symptoms in arm and leg, hospital, gradual recovery. Now, interestingly, these weren't necessarily, in fact, there was only one of the seven, as I recall, um, actually directly associated by the practitioner with a particular technique of HVT. The rest were during examination, articulation, traction, a whole range of things. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch on that with respect to stroke. Some of you might have seen in the BMJ recently, um, there was a head-to-head kind of band manipulation, don't band manipulation for neck pain, and a debate about that. And it's worth following up and checking out. It's an interesting debate. As good as anything are the the rapid responses that you'll have open access to. Now, my take on it is that the best data to date, which compares... Stroke rates in chiropract- patients seeing chiropractors with stroke rates in patients seeing um, GPs for head and neck pain. They show an increased risk for chiropractic and the same risk in people seeing GPs. And the author's conclusion is that folks going to see chiropractors are going with a kind of prodromal or a, or, or a stroke, um, a di- vertebral dissection in process and developing stroke. So the key, and I think that's why I wanted to include, and I'm grateful to um, Roger Kerry and Taylor to, for their paper they wrote for the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine, which is reproduced in full in your pack. The key for us is to say, okay, like the challenges of differential diagnosis of multiple myeloma, we as practitioners need to think hard, our clinical skills up to identifying neck and head pain, which is of vascular origin. And that's our challenge as clinicians. Yeah? The, the Taylor and Kerry paper is helpful. There's an international, I'm not going to get the organisation, manual, manual Physical Therapy Association. Anyway, there's a framework coming out in a couple of months' time that I will try to access. I've seen a draft copy of it that I'll try to make available, probably through GOSC or, or BOA. Um, so there's some helpful clinical guidance there. But I think a good start of 10 is the paper that is in your pack there if you've got concerns about that. More prevalent, if we go just rapidly back to um, the frequencies, if you look here, rather than the strokes, which gets all the press, more prevalent was this peripheral neurology. Um, and what's in there it essentially is radicular pain. Uh, now, we, we made some assumptions about what that was. It, uh, if, we, if we went through it, it was kind of disc injuries leading on to surgery and investigation and the like. So examples, aggravated disc injury prolapse, which exacerbated nerve root compression, caused by articulation of the lumbar spine. Non-specific musculoskeletal symptoms, these are folks developing kind of t- uh, typically acute pain during treatment. Um, so patient went into spasm after articulatory technique, um, went immediately to hospital, medication released same day, fine within three days. And these are sometimes people turning over on the, on the plinth. Um, and then there were a, a group of folks with undiagnosed pathologies. Um, uh, obviously, multiple myeloma was in my mind a moment ago. And of course, it's very easy with hindsight, confirmation bias. You know, when, when you, you, the picture suddenly comes clear, when you look back, you're reviewing your records and you haven't spotted a diagnosis. These things are often complex, but sometimes pathology emerged during treatment. So there was one case, as I recall, for example, of someone doing a um, um, uh, mid-thoracic HVT dog uh, supine and uh, a fractured humerus. And what it turned out was that that was someone who had quiescent breast cancer 
and a metastatic osteosarcoma spread to the humerus. Um, and, you know, that fracture was diagnostic in that case. Um, so some of these things actually, in a way, that one I think resolved kind of helpfully in a way because it provided a, a diagnosis and treatment was forthcoming. Um, but that's, that's our kind of general st stuff that we're all fighting with diagnostically. Now, this broad group of things defined as serious adverse events for the purpose of this study, we calculated a, a, a rate, and this is really a, a, a prevalence rate. This isn't really a risk rate. It's how often this happens, because it, 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 it just gives you an idea. And that worked out at um, 1 in 36,000 treatments. Now, of course, how certain we are about this, how useful it is, is difficult to say, because these things are rare. You only need under-reporting of a bit to change the figure. Yeah? But this is the best stab we've got at the moment as a guidance to how often it, it, it occurs. So in summary, most of uh, the literature focuses on central nervous system, uh, cerebral vascular um, adverse events, and we've been able to provide broader estimates for, for osteopathic practice. Um, and we have discovered evidence that some of these things do happen. So, you know, folks need to bear this in mind. It, it's not other dangerous folks, manual therapists do it. It happens in our practice as well. This type of study doesn't establish cause, clearly. Take radiculopathy. Um, the natural history of radiculopathy might include <coughs> presenting with what appears to be simple mechanical back pain, localised mechanical back pain. With or without intervention, you might develop leg pain. Um, so this is more estimates and a description of the kind of events that happen rather than establishing cause. Further work would need to do that. So our challenge for practitioners, some of this draws on some of the qualitative data, is how do we provide sufficient information for patients to make an informed choice of action? And what we saw in our interviews was that practitioners were often, and patients were saying, well, you give me the best advice. And practitioners were doing the best they wanted, they could. They were trying to make people better. Patients were saying they weren't interpreting information in terms of um, risk and hazard. They were interpreting information in terms of what's the risk of not getting better, not what the risk of being harmed, of being hurt. And that business, I mean, it happens to me when I'm doing my bestest to be the best consenter in the world after doing all this work. And I tell them stuff and go through my information and they'll say, well, you know, I know you wouldn't hurt me. Well, it's not about that. <laughs> now, I've got faith in you, it's fine. Do what you think best, you know. And for us as practitioners, this is complicated. You know, we need this knowledge of, um, of risk, of differential diagnosis, illness, disease, contraindications for our treatment. We need to kind of encapsulate knowledge about effectiveness to be up to date with that. Assessing patients' progress. These are high-level clinical skills, high-level clinical reasoning involved. And of course, that's doing that with individuals. Now, one or two of the conferences has been a little bit of a, you know, just give me the data for what I should tell the patient that presents with. Well, of course, we've got a very individualized model of care. And you, you can't do that. Professional practice is about juggling these complex decisions, this complex data, in uncertainty, within uncertainty, with patients, with their values, their experiences, with their past medical history, and they're making decisions. So there isn't just a, a this is the risk. It's about incorporating this information as best you can, which characterizes professional action. And we lay claims to being a profession. Um, so we have to act professionally. Um, so in terms of what to do and say, well, one, th there isn't a lot of data still. There's this, there's systematic reviews, but it's an under-researched area. So there's even uncertainty in that still. However, we have got some great data now, which can inform the way we discuss things with patients. That comes from the other projects done by the University of Brighton under the umbrella of um, NCOR, as with this, this project done by the British School of Osteopathy with colleagues. Include your own experiences as well, and think about the nature and variability of symptoms when talking to patients about what they should expect. We know that forewarned is forearmed. So what's the kind of process then? Maybe prior to attending, there's an opportunity for leaflets, e-information about what to expect, you know, what's going to happen um, when I see the osteopath. That, that stuff, it's not the time to say, um, you know, some folks have strokes. Yeah. <laughs> there's anxieties about advertising, but, 
you'd be surprised. You know, in some of the, around the, the country, you know, some folks are early in the waiting room are kind of going in early, actually, before I'm going to talk to you, here's the information about some of the risks. Well, some of that stuff is about the information the patients need. Some of that stuff might not be relevant. You know, if you're working on a bunion, I mean, you might work your way up, but, you know, it's a different risk profile from someone who's got a long history of rheumatoid arthritis and they come to see you to have a go at that neck pain and they're feeling a bit wobbly, you know. You know these are different. So, of course, global stuff doesn't work. So, in the new patient consultation, you know, it's about um, looking at the... The, the whole talking to people about the process, the wide range of telling them about the wide range of health questions in the examination, being clear that some parts of the examination might be painful, telling them that they can ask questions at any point, telling them they can stop you at any point, and really being clear about that. Giving information about the diagnosis. That might include um, using models and visual display. We've got a paper coming up in IJOM. It's in press at the moment, but you could access it through the Ozone, where you can look at patients' views, which I haven't covered on this, a survey of patients, sort of information they want. Giving information about common mindless adverse events and the rare major ones. Checking understanding, you know, checking. How, how do we check understanding? Reflecting on your own practice. The amount of times I speak to folks about trapped nerves and things hurting and pins and needles, and I say, D tell me, you know, tell me, refresh for me, repeat back to me. What, what's I say, well, the nerves are where the blood glow goes, and, and, you know, no. So checking understanding of information. But I work in an uh, in inner city area with, with, with a range of folk with, folks with limited English, so it's going to be more challenging maybe in my context than many of you, but, but checking information is important. Um, verbal consent before treatment, make a note of the risks, benefits and the alternatives. I haven't talked about the data today, but I can tell you that the best group of patients, which was new patients, 50% of the patient surveys said they'd had information about risk. Now, lots of reasons why patients might not recall information about risk, but that's what the patients were saying. So it's not maybe landing from, from us in some way. Certainly the osteopaths, most frequently, they said they, they did it all, because osteopaths said they did it all the time but it's not landing necessarily with patients, clearly. So, talking about future treatment. One of the issues is, um, kind of implied in the guidance, is that you should be doing this all the time. But maybe one of the ways forward is to discuss that with your patient. What information do you want on a regular basis? When we spoke to patients, patients said, we want information again, if you're going to do something new, you change your diagnosis, something especially risky, or there's some intimacy involved with it. Yeah? But asking the patient, I can repeat this if you like, but otherwise, you know, feel free to ask questions. How would you like to take it? Making a note of that. Yeah? And I think that probably concludes where I'm at. Thank you very much for your attention.